Tonight, we are so honored to have one of Building Bridges for America's Roadmap for Progress endorsed candidates, Alan Ellison, joining us here tonight. Alan is a uh, U.S. Senate candidate for the state of Florida, and uh, we're really excited by Alan's campaign um, and the work that Alan has been doing prior to uh, launching into the campaign world. And so, um, Alan, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself a little bit more, and then we'll get uh, started into some questions and answers tonight. So thank you so much, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate the opportunity and thanks for the endorsement. And thank you all for all that you have been doing uh, to amplify not only our, our campaign's message, but all of the candidates that you endorse. It is so important to have uh, individuals, change agents, and people who are just really passionate about our country, our democracy, to be engaged in the way that you are. It's one of the things that I try my best to stimulate uh, in the state and across the nation. Again, my name's Alan Ellison. I'm running for the United States Senate. One of the reasons that I jumped into this race is because when I look around Florida, when I look around this country, I realize that uh, it's broken up between two groups of people, those who have and those who have not. And it is those who have not that make up the greatest majority that are in desperate need of a champion. When I'm, talk, when I'm talking about those who have not, I'm talking about those who simply do not have a U.S. Senator, or those who don't have a representative who is looking out for uh, their interests, people that are in the workplace, who are getting paid, women that are getting paid less than men for equal work, African Americans who simply don't have access to financial opportunities, Hispanic Americans who are oftentimes targeted uh, when they go to work into the fields and, and being deported. And really, it's, it's, just the, it's just the same of things that I see. I grew up in an agricultural community. Population of African Americans were like 8%. And what I, one of the things that I noticed was is that we were being charged for uh, garbage pickup and, and certain utility services uh, for over 30 years without ever receiving the service. Uh, I remember in my community where African Americans were paying for city water and the water was uh, filled with all types of pathogens and E. coli and various things. So there was like environmental racism. There was like a low standard of living. And the thing is, is that I believe that if you don't know where I come from, if you don't know who I am, if you don't care enough, then there is no way that you could represent my interests. So, that is kind of a foundation of why I decided to get into this race. But a little bit more detail about how I got into it was I was an education major and I was majoring uh, in education and business and in, in, in undergraduate school. And I happened to come across a course uh, taught by Dr. Fitzgerald. He was teaching American government and he talked a great deal about making social impact through policy. The way he taught the course inspired me enough to change my major from education to political science. I ended up getting my degree uh, in 2007 from Florida Southern College. Uh, I, I got married. We had our, our child, uh, who's a beautiful girl, 11 years old, born on 32, uh, who thinks she's my boss. In 2018, I decided to uh, open up a salon, which I'm in my salon right now. And uh, right before I decided to open it up, the death of uh, Florida's congressional District 17 uh, Democratic nominee passed away 30 days before the election. I decided to put my name into, in the hat for the special election. I won the special election with 52% of the vote against three other contenders. By the time I had won the special election, it was only 28 days before the general election. The ballots were already printed up and my name did not appear on the ballot. We worked hard anyways. We went to uh, everywhere that we could go. We went to places where they hadn't seen a politician at the federal level in 20 years. Uh, we went into the red parts of the state. Uh, in fact, the Congressional District 17 is the largest congressional district in Florida and it's the most red with the most Republican voters. Uh, we were able to secure 117,000 votes in 28 days against a three-term state senator who had been campaigning for a year and raised almost a million dollars. What that did for us is it let us know 
that if we work hard enough, if we go into places where uh, people or politicians don't, don't go into, and we engage the voters and ask the question of what keeps you up at night, and not only that, work diligently to find solutions for current problems, then we know that we can bring people over to our side. And so with 117,000 votes, we brought over independents and Republicans. And so today I'm running for the United States Senate because I know that those individuals need champions on the issues that matter most to them. But more importantly, I know that with the policies that we push, with the help that we can bring, I know that we can flip forward and I know that we can get the people the, the help that they need. And so thank you so much for allowing me to uh, give you a little bit of background about who I am. Thank you so much, Alan. And I think you can see just in that, uh, that starting intro why we uh, chose to endorse Alan um, and support his campaign for US Senate. And um, so Alan, um, just a quick question. If you haven't, it's fine. Have you had a chance to read The Some of Us by Heather McGee yet? I got halfway through it. All right, fair enough. And I think we're, we're like halfway, so no worries. And I'm, I literally just finished reading this week's reading about two hours ago. So <laughs> I'm a procrastinator <laughs> at heart. But, you know, and you, you kind of talked about it in your intro. You know, I, I don't remember your exact words, but those who are and those who aren't or those who have and those who do not. And, you know, um, McGee kind of talks about this zero sum game, which essentially is a win lose situation. And, you know, you're in a primary right now. How, as a candidate, are you running your campaign and making sure that regardless of the result, it doesn't turn into a uh, uh, win-lose situation, whether you are the winner or if another challenger would win that primary? Well, it's just like what they talked about in the book. It's really about raising the consciousness of a people to, to understand the benefit of what we're doing. And what we're doing is we're raising a lot of awareness on the issues that matter. I talked about uh, gender pay inequality, for example, uh, something that we've seen since 1963 with the Equal Pay Act signed by President John Kennedy. Uh, even today in 2022, we still have individuals that are being paid disparagingly based on gender and race. And the thing that I want to be able to do is to raise the awareness on this issue and others uh, so that people can begin to uh, build coalitions and put pressure on legislators so that we can get more teeth into the existing bill to uh, level the playing field. There should not be a case in any company across the country where women are being paid less than men for the same work or African-Americans or people of color being paid less uh, for equal work. There should be an equal standard. And it's one of the things that I'm going to push for as senator. Uh, it's the thing that I'm pushing for now. I talk about it a great deal. And I think uh, with us being able to reach organically 10 million people every 28 days through our social media engagement and coupled with what uh, uh, your organization is doing and, and other organizations, uh, as we build this momentum and build these coalitions, we're going to have all of the strength that we need going into Congress to be able to get the bills that we need to pass to improve the quality of life for families. And that's what I'm about. Uh, and so whether I win the primary or lose the primary, the goal is to raise the awareness so that we can get policies to benefit people. And I tell my team all the time, you don't have to necessarily be in Congress to make social impact. This is the reason that I got into politics. This is who I am. And I'm winning on that front already. And we appreciate that, you know, that that's so huge to, you know, raising awareness. And I, I wrote down building coalitions and um, that regardless of the results, we are 100% confident because we saw it in 2018 when, you know, you put up the fight within that short month and it didn't turn out the way uh, you wanted it to um, and ultimately us. But now you're stepping up again. 
And um, we just really, we appreciate that fight that you have and that uh, desire to really raise awareness and lift up all people and do so by having conversations that aren't being had. So appreciate that. And if you have questions that you would like to ask Alan, uh, please do so um, in the chat. We would love to get some uh, questions from you, the audience members. I gave you homework. I included that link in the sign up. Uh, if you have questions for Alan, we only had one person do their homework. And as a teacher, I'm very disappointed. So we will get to uh, Kathy, I believe, asked a question. Um, but if you have some as we continue the conversation, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Well, my next question, Alan, um, pretty much the flip. And we've heard it. Um, and if you could think of another issue or just general way you're doing so, how are you incorporating what uh, McGee calls the solidarity dividend, a win-win situation? How are you bringing that into your campaign's messaging? You know, what's interesting is I came across that, that concept today. And we are, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to let everyone know that we all have a part to play. Uh, and so when people join the campaign, I always like to ask the question is, uh, what is your why? Why are you joining the campaign? And then I let them know what my why is, because my why is about improving the quality of life. And if we can all have a better quality of life, then we are stronger as a country. I try to let people in the campaign understand that together we can achieve uncommon dreams divided, we can't get very far. And I, I often talk about the concept of, of bridges versus walls. We know that throughout history, walls have always served as a mechanism to divide us. We know that the only man-made object that you can see from the moon is the Great Wall of China. It took 100 years to build it. And when it was complete, they found out that it simply did not work. But with bridges, we can come together, we can, we can mobilize, we can share information, share goods, share services, and we can build a, a more perfect union through bridge building. And I guess that's probably why uh, you all have the name Building Bridges, because you understand that only together can we build solidarity. And that is really my message. So what you will see on Twitter or my other social media platforms is the hashtag United for America or United for Florida. We all have our part to play. And if, if we leave people out of the political process, then we begin to break down as a society. And so I'm always trying to engage. That's why I am the most engaging candidate in this race. I ask the question, what keeps you up at night? And, and, and I'll tell you this, um, back in um, a few years ago, I was called the N-word by a county commissioner and it brought so much negative attention uh, to me, to my family. And, and one of the things that I did was I took all of that negative attention and I channeled it to the issues of what is affecting people in the community. And I created a, a, a forum that allowed people to come to the, the podium on the courthouse steps and they got a chance to talk about what was impacting them. And what I found out by doing that was, is that when we give people an opportunity to voice their concerns to the public, when we give them an opportunity to voice their concerns to leadership, it inspires them to become in, uh, politically engaged in the process. And what we see right now is, is that not only do we have a lot of uh, social division, racial division, political division in this country, we also have a very low morale when it comes to political action and engagement. And so when you see me doing these things uh, like the Power Hour Town Hall or the Fridays for Florida, this is about building solidarity with the people. This is about getting them to understand that I hear them and not only do I hear them, but I'm gonna work towards policy that will directly positively impact their world. When we have more politicians doing that and engaging in that way, then we will see more people politically involved and we will see the solidarity uh, come into fruition. I, I love that. And I think um, the first time um, I heard your name and heard about your campaign, I went to your Twitter account. I think that's the first thing I saw is those, uh, the Friday events. 
Um, and I, I really love that because I think, as you said, you know, it's not all about, well, this is my policies and da, 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 da. No, it's, it's about hearing from the people. And I feel that I, that's so empowering to hear that someone running for such high office um, is taking time um, and to intentionally listen. Um, and so really appreciate that from you. So thank you so much, Alan, on that end. And uh, I see there's a uh, question starting to pour in. I'm loving that. Um, but we're going to first go to um, Kathy from Germantown, Ohio. And if someone on the team, if we could see if Kathy is joining us tonight. Now, Kathy, I don't remember if you remember your question or not. I got it pulled up. But if you don't remember it, no worries, I can read it for you, but we'll get your mic turned on so you can ask Alan your question. Oh, Kathy, yep, go uh, ahead. Yes, hi. Yeah, wow. Okay, I put in two really long questions. <laughs> Pick whichever um, one so, you want. Well, they were similar in nature. Um, I'm just trying to remember what I typed. It was long. Okay. I so can, I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, yeah. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and, and do that? That All would right. be fine. All right. Thanks, Kathy. So um, Kathy asked, uh, so in, in chap, so Kathy comes from a primarily white rural community near Dayton, Ohio. And, um, you know, uh, was wondering, because in chapter six, uh, McGee kind of lays out, you know, um, voting access and how it's rooted in racism and, um, you know, how to address that with voters. Then also the issue in chapter five with labor unions. And so, you know, kind of that common uh, messaging we may hear from individuals who aren't aware of the role of racism. How do you, um, what's your approach in conversing with someone who does not see the role racism plays when it comes to voting and when it comes to the role of unions um, in our country? Wow, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, I come from uh, Central Florida, uh, District 17, which is very rural. And there is a very large white population who does not believe that um, that lack of access to voting exists. Uh, I come across it all of the time. So one of the things that I've done is I've held at least three different town halls on the issue of voter suppression because oftentimes people are not aware of all of the different strategies of voter suppression. I know across 43 states, there have been at least 150 different voter, voter suppression strategies. And sometimes people just need to understand uh, what that looks like because the dominant, the dominant idea of, of what the messaging is around voter suppression, and that is uh, people just need to get an ID. And, and so whenever I see or hear uh, white Americans, white Floridians saying that, you know, everyone should have an ID and an ID should, you know, it shouldn't be the thing that stops you from being able to vote. And then when I start letting them know that, well, closing down voting precincts in some areas where people in uh, African American communities have to travel sometimes three hours to vote is a type of voter suppression. And so it's a matter of just having the dialogue and see I'm the kind of person where I will listen but in listening it opens a doorway to be heard and so I, I have the conversations I have the town halls I listen I'm in an area where it's dominated by uh, white Americans who don't believe like that but whenever we begin to just share all of the different ways that people are voting then it opens the question of do you think that this is something that we should be engaging in, in America? Because voting is a right, but in our state, our governor, Governor DeSantis doesn't believe that it's a right. He believes that it's a privilege. And so then the, the conversation is around 
um, do you believe that it's a right or do you believe that it's a privilege? Most Americans will say that it's a right. All you have to do is show them where that right has been violated or infringed upon in various strategies, and then you can get them to move to, to say, you know what, you're right about that. This should not be going on. People shouldn't have to drive three hours uh, to be able to vote. And then when you start talking about some of the bills that they introduce here in Florida, like you can't uh, give someone water to drink while they're standing in a line, that creates barriers for people who have uh, disabilities. I mean, if, if a person is disabled physically in some kind of way where they can't stand for too long, if you were to provide any type of aid to that person, you could find yourself going to jail while simply trying to provide aid so someone can exercise their right to vote. When you bring up all of the issues, and there are so many issues, in fact, we, we tell people all the time, there are 55,000 issues, and I personally do not believe that anyone is a single issue voter. I do believe that as a political scientist and have gone to school and studied politics and the role of government, I do believe that people are just not engaged enough to see all of the different facets of an issue and all of the different issues that exist. So the goal is to have conversation enough so that they can see all of the issues and all of the angles of the issue. The other uh, strategy is, is simply understanding how to communicate with people. One of the things I learned as a political scientist is that there is a way to communicate about politics. And most people don't understand that because they stand so firm on their perspective that they don't allow room for a conversation from the uh, opposing viewpoint. And as I said earlier, for someone like me, I may already know what the outcome of the conversation will be. I probably already know uh, the, the basis for their, for their arguments, but I still listen anyways because it's, it's a matter of just being respectful enough and strategic enough to create the dialogues because what I believe is, is that you may have an opinion, but if I start sharing enough facts, the facts are gonna overtake the opinion every single time. And so uh, from, a, from a labor standpoint, one of the things that I was reading about was racism really was just so deep and so prevalent that it kind of overshadowed uh, the, the, the whole idea that collective bargaining really benefits everyone. And so living in Florida, living in the South, you, you see that all of the time. We saw it under Trump whenever um, they were talking about immigration. There is so many benefits to immigration. In fact, immigrants are 70% more likely to start businesses and small businesses are the backbone to our economy. So to see people talk so negatively about things that really have such positive benefit, it just, it just really, um, inspires me to want to have a conversation with these individuals. And I've been very persuasive in being able to bring people over to the right side of thinking, but that takes time, it takes energy, and it takes someone who's just willing to do the, the necessary hard work of, of listening. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, really, um, really appreciate that. Um, we, we believe the same thing here at Building Bridges. That's why we have trainings about how to tell your political story, how to have those difficult conversations. And the number one thing is listening. <laughs> and it's hard to do. Um, um, so really appreciate that. And you know, you, you kind of ended there on unions. And so I just wanted to hear from you, um, you know, what, what has you been, you know, you're a business owner. So um, as a business owner, as a, a citizen, as a candidate, um, has your views on unions changed throughout your life? Um, how, were, how were your opinions shaped? And, um, you know, what role do you see unions playing in our country today? You know, my, my opinions and views have never changed on unions. The whole idea of people coming together in solidarity for the purpose of collectively bargaining for a better quality of life, um, a better work environment, uh, just a better overall, um, you know, just 
the way people live, it's, it's, it's better when people can come together. It, it's, my perspective has never changed. I believe that we need unions. We need good unions that you know, are looking out for its labor force. Uh, I believe it's such a shame whenever employers use tactics and strategies to try to bust up unions. Uh, because you know, as a business owner, I have always given uh, more benefit to my employees than even myself. I've always paid my employees more than I pay myself. I remember reading about this gentleman who had a business and he was paying himself about $1.4 million and his workers, they were struggling. And when we came into the pandemic, uh, his business started to decline because of low morale in his workplace. What he ended up doing was he started to pay himself a salary of 70,000 and took all of his profits and increased the amount of money that he was paying his, his, his workers. And just by that simple gesture, his business began to pick up, morale began to pick up, and he did even more business than he had ever done before. It would be good if employers did everything to look out for their employees because without the employees, the business does not have a strong, sustainable life cycle. And so, you know, I believe in, I believe in unions, I believe in collective bargaining. Um, going through this book really helped me to understand the, the, the ups and the downs of, of, of labor unions and the struggles that they have had, especially with um, implicit bias and racism and how it has played its part, especially in the South. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really amazing. We, we did see a decline. Um, but after reading this book, I think I'm going to be doing a lot more talking about collective bargaining and, and labor unions and the benefits and how people have been able to live a better quality of life. And if you all know me, you know that my campaign's theme is improving the quality of life. And we can do that in solidarity. We can do that together. And we can do that through labor unions. Thank you so much. And uh, I misspoke earlier. We actually had two questions submitted prior to tonight. And so I want to give Patty from Long Island, New York, the chance to answer or uh, ask their question. And so team, could we see if Patty is on the call? And if so, we'll get their mic turned on. Patty if, <clears throat> Patty, if you could raise your hand, that would make it so much easier to find you, it kind of bumps you to the top of the list. And I don't see a Patty by name listed, so. But I see a John from New York. Hmm. Patty, uh, yes, Patty, you can make a contribution. You can do that at alanellison.com. Just want yep. you to know. <laughs> Please go, it's a great website and, and see if you can support him. That would be wonderful. Uh, is it, what's the last name for Patty? Um, I don't have a last name, so okay. uh, no worries. But you know what I'm going to do is I will ask Patty's question. Great. Um, for them. So right. um, Patty writes, the information in this book is critical for moving forward toward racial equity. And so as a candidate, are you hearing these ideas being discussed within your state party's leadership? Um, maybe from other candidates running for the same office you are, for other offices at various levels of government, but are, and so one, are you hearing these discussions at the party level, state, national, local, and what policy practice changes are you implementing um, as part of the conversations and a part of the work that uh, McGee has presented so far in the book? Um, you know, to be honest, Patty, you put me on the spot with this question. Uh, I have not seen um, any conversation from the party um, at the state level or really the, the federal level uh, on this issue. Uh, it is an issue that is near and dear to me. It's one of those issues that uh, we just recently had a Fridays for Florida conversation around, uh, and that's equity and what that is all about. Uh, I like to talk about these issues because one, it raises awareness 
on uh, the inequities of you know, where we are in this state, but not, not only the state, across this country. The thing that I like to talk more about, in order to get equity, you first have to have access. And for a lot of African-Americans and people of color, uh, we simply do not have the same level of access. Uh, I was at a town hall recently, and this question came up about what can uh, we do as white people in this, in this city uh, to help black people with racial equity uh, and, and social justice. And I was really disappointed uh, that the individual said that there wasn't anything that we, that we can do. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that just like labor unions try to do, um, and like they talked about in this book, they wanted to make sure that they are uh, moving everyone forward simultaneously and they try to use different strategies to do it. Uh, one of the things that I just simply try to do is to, is to tell stories and let, pe let the public see what black and brown people go through. So for example, when I talk about access in order to gain equity, we know that home ownership in America is the foundation of building equity and um, and just simply a strong financial base in this country. Uh, when I had been on my job for four years, I had a credit score of 740. My rent was $350 a month. Uh, my water bill was $50. Cell phone bill was $16. And I was trying to get a home loan for uh, $69,000. I went to every single bank in the county and I was turned down by every single one. I finally decided to go to a credit union that I had a, a credit um, account with, and I was turned down by them too. Um, my debt income ratio was extremely well because I didn't have hardly any debt. And I just asked the, the loan officer, I was like, you know, why am I being denied for this loan? You know, I, everything checks out. And she simply told me that I don't believe that you would make the payments. Now, this is something that people who look like me have to deal with on a daily basis. I remember uh, writing a business plan for a, a African American lady and her husband. Um, they both had, you know, 700 plus credit scores. Uh, they had homes around the state. Uh, net worth $1.4 million. Uh, they had a great business plan because I wrote it. And all they wanted to do was to get uh, a loan to start an apartment complex to build some affordable housing units. They were turned down by every single bank in this area. Um, they happened to move to Atlanta. They took the same great credit, uh, great work history, uh, great net worth and, and great business plan to Atlanta where the loan officers were black and they got the loan that they asked for from the first bank. They thought that might have been a fluke. So they went to another bank where the loan officers were black again and they got the loan. They got uh, approved for the loan again. And so from a very early age, like in my early 20s, I realized that lack of access breaks down the equity component for people in this country that look like me, people of color. And so one of the things that I wanted to be able to do is to get into uh, Congress so that I can write policies that will level the playing field, that will uh, reform the, the, the systems that are in place that keep black and brown people from being able to move forward in life uh, like our financial systems, you take the FICO score system. It's not recognized around the world. It came in into play in the 80s, but it's a system. It's a it's a credit reporting system that is discriminatory. It is predatory. It forces black and brown people and poor people alike to have to pay more in interest rates by because they're poor, because they're they're in disadvantaged situations, and it, it's just a shame that people who look like me and people who are uh, financially disadvantaged usually have to pay more in life and it's just not right. So it's really about 
uh, creating policies that give access so that we can have equity and equality. Thank you so much. I, I wrote what you kind of started. In order to get equity, you have to have access to equity. Um, and that's so true. And and the power of stories, um, you just sharing your, your story. I thank you for being raw and honest with us. And the power of story is huge in changing people's minds um, because too often or not, we don't get to hear people's stories. So um, appreciate your... Um, Focus, uh, your willingness to share, and then also your desire to amplify your story and other stories as you um, seek to lift up all Floridians and all Americans. And so um, we're going to transition to our next question. And I got to scroll up to um, find it here. Um, now, I know you know Nessa very well, but Nessa asked a question that I would love to hear more from. Uh, so Nessa, we'll get uh, your mic turned on and you can go ahead and ask your question about um, voter suppression. Great. Thank you so much, Wes. Hey there, Alan. Um, so what economic outreach policies would you like to see happen for smaller communities and cities that would create economic opportunities for Black Floridians? Thank you so much uh, for this. You know, back in 2006, 2007, I actually used to hold seminars and symposiums on this issue. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, African Americans are, are at a significant disadvantage when it comes to accessing um, financial institutions, um, when it comes to their businesses. It's just I mean, I don't really know too many black people that have, that have had success with gaining access. And so the thing that I would like to see happen is there be a streamlining process with the Small Business Administration. The Small Business Administration generates about $2 billion a year for the purpose of lending uh, and granting money to small businesses on the grounds of whether they're going to start a business or whether they're going to expand their business. But the process for, uh, for getting access to those funds is so strenuous that it deters a lot of people from even going through the process. Uh, it's so invasive. They ask so many questions that they really shouldn't be asking about your know, personal business, family, and all of these things. And people are just really uh, deterred. If our goal is to strengthen our economy and small businesses are the driving force of our economy, then we should be doing everything in our power to uh, stimulate small business development. One of the things that I would like to see happen is that there be uh, a business incubator in black communities across the state that is subsidized by the federal government and basically uh, help uh, to be funded by the Small Business Administration. We have seen this program work very well uh, with various communities, uh, with veterans. We've seen it work uh, in the suburban areas, but we really haven't seen it work or it happen in Black communities. I believe that with the creativity uh, of Black people, with the ingenuity of Black people, if they had a a partner like the US government through the SBA and partnership with colleges to create these uh, business incubators within the community. I know that it would be successful. I know that more businesses would start. I know this because I have been pretty much a business incubator myself, uh, creating and setting up over uh, 400 businesses uh, within the African American community throughout Florida. Uh, I have served as an incub a business incubator uh, uh, through my nonprofit, which is now under the Ellison Foundation. We do this each and every day. In fact, I just set up a business for someone today, um, and I plan to do the same thing for someone tomorrow. But I think if we had governmental resources subsidizing the process and stimulating this across the state, uh, we would increase our financial base, our economic base. Uh, not only in the community, but it will have a fallout throughout uh, the entire state and it can be replicated throughout the entire country. Thank you so much, uh, Nessa, for your question and that thoughtful response. And for what not only are you doing as a candidate to make 
um, economic uh, improvements uh, for Floridians, but also you're already doing the work through your own nonprofit and as a business owner. So appreciate you walking the talk. Uh, appreciate that. And I am Beulah. Uh, you had a question. And so your question was related to uh, unionization. And I know we kind of already talked about that, but you know, most Americans are not unionized. And if they are, it's more so in the public sphere versus the private sphere. And so um, if you had a quick answer, how what would you say to them, to outsiders uh, from unions, what would you say to help them better understand the role of a union? I would say that the whole purpose of unions is simply to uh, collectively bargain uh, for the purpose of improving the quality of life for uh, workers within the working environment. It's designed to improve work, uh, working conditions and it's designed to get workers the benefits that they need and oftentimes deserve. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the book was early on unions were, um, unions were a thing that caught on from everyone. Everybody kind of caught on. And then they had this whole idea that if you were supporting the, the civil rights movement, then obviously, uh, you were with the unions. And so that kind of moved people away, a lot of white people, especially white males, away from unions because it became a racial thing. And I think with that strategy, we can see it playing out throughout all types of policies. Uh, for example, if you look at where we are with uh, the, the COVID pandemic, a lot of times it is it has gone from racially uh, motivated to politically motivated and, and, and people have become divided on these issues simply because of strategy and how people are weaponizing race when it comes to social justice, they're weaponizing race when it comes to unionization, they're weaponizing uh, race when it comes to uh, policy and it is a very dangerous uh, construct. When I was reading the, um, the book today, I was trying to formulate a strategy on how do we overcome it. And I think the best way to overcome it is to simply call it out for what it is. You have people that are using these strategies for the purpose of, uh, of being able to stay in power, where people, as long as people are divided along race, and I think Lyndon Johnson talked about this one time as president, if you can keep people divided on race, they won't even realize that you're picking their pockets. And that's what these employers are doing. They are utilizing race in such a way that people are so divided among uh, labor and competition that they're not realizing that the top 1% are, are getting all the benefit and, and the workers are getting the, are getting the peanuts. And so people need to be educated. And I believe that as a campaign, as a candidate, as a political scientist, it is our responsibility to educate the people, whether they be voters, whether they be uh, workers, uh, immigrants, whoever is, in, is a stakeholder in this process, they need to know what's going on. They need to know how this game is being played. And that is the only way we're gonna ever get uh, positive change is when people become educated enough about what's going on. Thank so, you so much. So having this, having this conversation tonight, uh, this is the type of thing that we should be doing on a national basis. You asked me uh, early on, is the party doing this? No, the party's not having this conversation, but this is a conversation that the party could win on if the party was having this conversation. This should be on C-SPAN. This should be on a CNN town hall. Uh, yeah, and I, I literally wrote it down. And I think um, somewhere in, I think in chapter six, essentially 
um, McGee uses a similar language of we have to call it out for what it is. And, you know, I think um, we had some individuals last week who shared like how they were going to, well, their action step from was just to start talking to other people about what they're reading. Um, and we have to engage in it and um, it's critical. And it's, and like you said before, it's not gonna change overnight, um, but we have to be willing and continually bringing up the true cause um, of all of these issues. Um, and it's racism here in America. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, how, you know, unions literally are using race to divide workers from the opportunity to collectively bargain and lift up conditions for all workers. And another issue that we're, people are using race to divide our society today uh, is at the education level. And so Cindy um, put a question there in the chat regarding that topic of CRT and uh, CSE. And so Cindy, we will get your mic turned on. And then we probably have like one more question and then we're going to give Alan a chance to do a wrap up because uh, we've already gone over the 45 minutes. <laughs> Is hey, Cindy, Cindy still with us? Unmuted? Yep, go ahead, Cindy. Okay, thanks. I um, am just really enjoying this presentation tonight and learning about how um, Alan has been, you know, talking with voters in uh, Florida, and we're having a lot of similar situation here in Nebraska. I'm running for legislature here in uh, Nebraska, and a lot of the voters are almost starting out with questions about CRT and CSE, you know, uh, comprehensive self sex education. It seems like it's a divide that a lot of voters are really focused on. And I believe when we have more time to talk, it's something that we can overcome. But I'm just wondering if you're finding that that's one of the very first issues you're running into as well. Here in Nebraska, they're really kind of whipping this up um, as one of the topics. And it's just unfortunate. I'm curious if you have any suggestions on, along those lines. It's not something that I'm running into per se, but it is something that I'm aware of because it's a, it's a growing conversation here in Florida, especially with our governor uh, targeting schools who are trying to um, teach history. Um, critical race theory is a college level course, usually at law schools. It's not even taught at grade school level, but part of the Republican narrative is to weaponize uh, critical race theory in a way where it, it, it gives them the rally, it gives them the coalition building strength around uh, racism to get their voters out. And what we have seen in the state of Florida because of this issue and COVID and the argument of freedom versus uh, masking is that this time last year in Florida, we had 97,000 more registered Democrats than uh, Republicans. The last couple of days, I think I saw where there are 67,000 more Republicans registered over Democrats. And it's because of these issues. These issues uh, that are racially charged stimulates an element within our society to come out and become politically active and politically motivated. The best thing that you could do to overcome the issue is to be very direct with people and just ask the question, do you think that slavery was something that America should have engaged in? Most people will try and save face and tell you, no, America should have never engaged in that. Then you ask the next question and say, um, what could we do to make sure that we never have slavery in this country again? And just let them give you answers. Once they're done, you can simply say, that is what critical race theory is all about. Addresses the issue and find solutions so that we don't get into that ever again. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. And then like for me, I, I am very good when it comes to educating voters because as a political scientist, 
Educated voters are the best voters that you can have. And it is our responsibility to educate, educate, educate. Campaigning is really educating. And so it takes time, it takes effort. And the best thing that you can do is to hold town halls in those communities along those issues and be willing to hear things that you don't want to hear for the purpose of being able to share the things that people need to hear. Because I believe this, I'm a firm believer in the idea that a person can have an opinion all day long, but truth and facts will always cut through. And it may not happen in the moment because people are always trying to save face for the audience. But when they go home, they look in the mirror and they think about what was said, it does have a way of reaching people. And so that means that you're going to have to get out there and you're going to have to hold the town halls. I think, I don't know of anybody in the state of Florida that had, that have uh, had more town halls than me. I have a weekly uh, town hall, which I call the um, Fridays for Florida virtual discussion and the power hour chat on Twitter. But I also have a monthly theme town hall on the issues that matter to Floridians. And, and the only reason I do this is because voters need to understand uh, these issues and really how the issues directly impact them. Because people will take on information that they hear off of like Fox and CNN and all of these social media uh, outlets but they really don't know exactly how the policies will directly impact their worlds. And so town halls can give us the opportunity to discuss and see exactly how policy is gonna directly impact them. Because you know, when, when you start looking at all of these different issues, some issues won't have impact on individuals at all. And some issues will have direct impact on people. So for example, uh, I always say that there are 55,000 issues that literally impact millions of people. If we talk about enough issues, we're gonna soon start to realize that we have more in common than not. So if a person is a Republican on the second amendment, well, guess what? What's gonna have more impact on that person sooner or later is whether or not they're gonna be able to depend on their social security. Because if the Republicans have it their way, they want to dismantle Social Security. So what does that person want more? Do they want access to their gun or do they want their check every month? And so it's a matter of being able to engage in all of the different issues and how those issues directly impact the worlds of, of everyone. And what they'll, what they'll realize is, is that critical race theory really doesn't affect them at all, but their Social Security, their health care, uh, their water quality, uh, their air quality that, that they breathe, those things have direct impact. And so it's a matter of how do you win? Do you win on, on letting the Republicans control the narrative or do you take the bull by the horn and start to uh, lead on the, on the conversations, lead on the issues and bring everybody into your world and so that they can see that, you know what, this candidate is a whole lot different than what we were used to. We're just used to people just dictating, but this candidate is actually listening and providing some real solutions and some fresh ideas on things that we've never even heard of. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, and I, and I think whether you're a candidate like Alan and Cindy, or if you're just a grassroots organizer who believes in our progressive values, um, we have to control that narrative. And, we have to be talking about things that really are making impacts on lives and amplifying um, not only our stories, but I think someone said it in our first week is, you know, it's okay to amplify our own, but we have to amplify our brothers and sisters stories as well to help um, nail that um, solidarity dividend um, and realize it's not just about us, it's about everyone. And we can only do that when we lift everyone's um, voices up. So appreciate that. Alan, we've gone an hour here. Um, I told, uh, told you that it would be 30, 45 minutes. So I appreciate your time. <laughs> and so if you could, um, and thank you, Nessa. Nessa's been putting in uh, Alan's campaign website, a direct link to um, the campaign's Act Blue account. <laughs> 
We really would appreciate you amplifying their messages. But Alan, I just wanted to give you a quick minute or two to uh, just a concluding message on you know, how racism does cost everyone and how we can come together to ensure we all prosper and any other last words you have for us this evening. Yes, I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to uh, converse with me and, and have uh, some conversation around this issue. I believe that it's a very important issue. It's one that we, we definitely need to have more uh, on the national level, especially here in the state of Florida, because we have some really, really bad people who want to take uh, policy back to a place where it was only good for some. And what I want to do is I want to write policy where we can improve the quality of everyone's life. Good policy, good leaders, and good government should always be about moving our society forward in the right direction, not moving us backwards. And so, you know, the thing is, is that uh, if we can, if we can come together, if we can learn together, if we can listen to one another with an open mind and an open heart. Uh, that's where we will have our best opportunity uh, to understand one another, to appreciate one another, and to really understand that America is only as great as it is because of our diversity. Our diversity is what gives us a rich culture. It gives us a rich uh, financial structure because of, of how uh, we bring our collective uh, powers, our collective synergies together and just really make this place great. Anyone who does not understand that uh, really needs to uh, have these conversations so that they can really better understand it. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. Truly appreciate it. And we'll be uh, continuing to amplify um, your campaign uh, all the way through the primary and then into the general election as well. So thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You.